Also jetzt können wir, glaube ich, oh, ich bin auch schon laut gestellt, ich höre mich ganz anders. Ich bin da. Wahnsinnig viel auf meinem Tisch liegen, das muss ich erstmal wieder Ups. alles sortieren. Sorry, I'm, I'm speaking in German also now. Hi, hello everybody, welcome. Welcome everybody. Good to have you on the panel. Um, we're just going to start. It's a bit of a weird situation for me because last year I was here in the same studio, but there were no people here except the technicians. So I'm very, very pleased to welcome you to this industry event in a hybrid format of the 63rd Nordische Film Tage Lübeck. Uh, also on behalf of our managing director, Susanne Kasimir, and our artistic director, Thomas Heiler. They will also show up at some moment. They have a very busy schedule running around from one event to the other. Um, but they sent their greetings. Um, before I start introducing the lovely panel that's here partly in person and mainly on screens of experts from the film funds, um, I want to thank a few partners in preparing this event. Um, we always uh, collaborate in this event with the Creative Europe Desk in Hamburg and with the Moyen Film Fund. So I'm very pleased that uh, we're doing this event together for many years now. I try to, record, to remember what the first one was actually that we did. But it's my 11th year here in Lübeck, and I think it's nearly as long that we're doing this together. And so it's very inspiring to talk about like what's important for us, what do we want to do, what do we feel is urgent, what do we feel is interesting also for the producers and the industry uh, from the film industry that we're trying to address. Um, so uh, a very warm thanks to Christiane and Britta and Lisa from the Creative Europe Desk in Hamburg and the entire network of Creative Europe Desks that we're always like activating or that they are activating to get information, to get like a feel for what's going on in the countries, in the industry. Uh, Ene Katrine Rasmussen in Denmark especially is always participating. Elisabeth Almo in Norway gave like really good input for this one. So uh, very nice and warm and uh, heartfelt thank you to the Creative Europe Desk Network. And of course to Moin this year, uh, Katrin, your colleague that usually prepares this with us, is on a sabbatical and is coming back, but she did sign in with her private email address to screen this online. So uh, I promised her to erase and forgot her email address after, but a very warm welcome and thank you, not only to Katrin, who's usually doing this every year, but to the entire team, uh, Julia, everybody, Heike, and of course Helge, who's on the panel also. I want to thank the Hanse Museum also that's hosting us here with this panel. It's always very nice to be here. And um, that's enough for me from my side, and I'm going to just start with introducing the panel of experts that we have here today, which I'm very thankful for. I'm going to start on my left with Kalle Bjerko, who's a film commissioner for fiction film at the Danish Film Institute. Kalle, can you hear us? Are you there? I'm not entirely sure if he is already. Hi, Kalle. Yeah. Kalle can't hear us, I think, so we have to figure that out technically. Kalle? Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Now we can. Yes. Can you hear us? I don't think he can hear us yet, or maybe he no. can. Can yeah, I think the sound is it's like uh, it sounds like mice on steroids. Yeah, that's how we talk. That's that's, that's exactly right. That's what we do. That's what we're yeah. doing here. No. Can we fix He's that in the, again. with the sound okay. in the back? Uh, why don't we pass on to welcoming the one person where we're sure that he can hear us. Uh, I'll come back to you, uh, Kalle, in a second, right? We'll just let the technicians figure that out, the sound problem. Uh, Helga, I remember last year you had a technical issue as well when you were on the panel welcoming everybody, which as much as you test this is always someone who doesn't work. This year you didn't yeah. take any chances in your yeah. person. So I'm very happy to welcome Helga Albers, the Managing Director of the Moyen Film Fund Hamburg Schleswig-Holstein. Welcome and thanks for being on the panel. Um, then after we have our next expert, Helen Arlsen, Film Commissioner for Moving Sweden and International Co-Productions from the Swedish Film Institute. Helen, can you hear us? Yes, loud and clear. Very Thank good. you for inviting me. Very good. Lovely to have you. And right next to you, we have Anders Tangen, the Head of Development and Audience from the Norwegian Film Institute. Anders, can you hear us? Yes, it seems so as well. Yeah, I hear you. Very good. So let's get back to Kalle and see if we figured out what the problem was. Kalle, is it better now or are we still sounding like mice on steroid? I like that description, but he's stuck now, Kalle, I think. He's a bit frozen, yeah. All right. <laughs> he also looks as if he saw a mouse, a mouse on steroid, so I hope that's gonna, I hope we're gonna get him back. Uh, we'll figure that out behind the scenes. Uh, welcome to a hybrid industry event at the Nordische Film Tag Lübeck. Um, I'm very happy to have audience here again, as I said. Um, we're going to uh, talk to the four 
now again four experts that we have on the panel. Hi, Kalle. Hi. It, lo it looks for us as if you're back. I'm back. It just had, it had the sound was very, very weird, and I changed <laughs> the browser, so now I'm here. Very good. Lovely to have you. You only missed the introduction of your lovely colleagues, and I'm happy to introduce you as the last but not least. Uh, so Kalle Bjerke is Film Commissioner for Fiction Film at the Danish Film Institute. Welcome for, to you as well. Thank you. Cool. Um, we're going to have a little round where we're just going to uh, talk to you four for like five minutes each. And then we're going to bring three filmmakers on the panel to give like a little spotlight and to represent the producer side um, of this whole question um, that we're discussing here today. And um, yeah, let's just um, start with uh, what we want to say. So the title of the panel is Support Diversity Structural Funding Measures for Diversity in Film Production. Quite a mouthful. Um, I think it will be really interesting to talk about different aspects of diversity and what we actually mean with this. What are the challenges? What are like the like, successes maybe that we had already? Where are we standing? And uh, Kalle, if you're okay with that, I'm just going to pass it over to you. And maybe you can give us a bit of input from the Danish Film Institute, from your role, from your background also before you started working as a film commissioner on uh, what's on your mind when it comes to diversity in film production. Yes, uh, well, I'm a, I'm a film commissioner at, uh, at the Danish Film Institute, and uh, I came from uh, a role as a script writer and a director of primarily um, uh, comedy and kids' uh, uh, stories. Um, Working, coming into the uh, gave me awareness of uh, working with um, with um, with the um, uh, diversity question because it was like a thing. Well, I worked real natural with it when I worked with kids because kids has a very natural way of interact with the world around them. So it was it was a natural thing to for me to act into to this discussion directly, but. Um, coming into um, the institute, there was a, a big awareness program uh, for me as a decision maker and educating me of uh, how to to think around these, uh, 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 wrap my head around these uh, these uh, the issues that we that we need to face. So it's like uh, we have like in the institute we have like. A, different kind of awareness strategies. Um, we work with external strategies where we like, we uh, work with the business and to, to find the, our blind, blind angles and force producers to like self-report on diversity and uh, uh, in front and behind the camera. And then we present a lot of data for them. So we, we actually can have a qualified discussion about what, what are the issues here. Uh, on, internally, we have, especially on recruiting, uh, and that's the head of the departments, uh, that we actually have a strategy for them, that they have the blind angles um, illuminated through, uh, through um, uh, bias courses. Um, and, and me as well, and the decision maker, we uh, have awareness the strategy on working with unconscious bias courses. So, how does our brain work, rely on patterns, and how do we work our way around these, uh, these mm -hmm. patterns? And can you tell us a bit and, more? Sorry yeah. to interrupt you, but can you tell us a bit more about these bias courses? So, you took part in them before starting your position. There was a training program for you. How, what did that involve? How did that go? Can you tell us a bit more well, about this? Um, I find that a very interesting point. Yes, and so what we all decision makers that has to go through this course, and it's a course that we work actually with a specialist that goes all the way down into how the brain patterns work, how we see patterns to protect ourselves and, and gain our, our own animal wants and how to work around them. So it's it's a both a course that makes us aware of this of this pattern, the, our, our way of thinking, and uh, a course that gives us the tools uh, to um, uh, 
to um, how to say just these patterns. Yeah, and so now, oh no, no, now you are feeling prepared for your role in taking decisions because your position is really one to decide who's getting funded and who's not getting funded. So you're really at the source of like deciding in a way which stories are told, which creators get funding. Did you feel that you were well prepared coming into this role, or how was it for you? Well, it's it, everything like a way of uh, learning by doing. You you can have an awareness, but when it comes out to actually um, uh, putting these uh, uh, thinking patterns or or, 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 or changing them uh, and and actually making an output. Uh, films that are diverse and 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 have that diverse uh, view it's a whole different thing and um, we, we, we're still working really hard on the output but the awareness, the awareness strategies are are there yeah I think it's a very good point to say that like of course first we have to create awareness but there is a moment also where like awareness isn't enough if nothing's changing if there's not a different output if realities don't change. I mean, there has been many panels on many festivals on diversity already, which of course, once we started like thinking about doing this panel, we were aware of. But as long as like things don't change, I felt and we felt from the team that it's important to talk about it and continue talking about it and to really bring something very concrete like into the discussion, which is money, which is output, as you mentioned. So I think these are very good points where we can really see, okay, we have an awareness or we start like, uh, we have like some first steps that we made but where are we going next and how are we making sure that this awareness is not just staying an awareness for us to feel better about ourselves but to really bring like change forward to have a more inclusive and have a more diverse uh, and a better representation in the industry on all levels of diversity for the people that we're making films or stories for. Um, so uh, I'm going to pass on to Helge now and um, thank you so much for the input already. And uh, yeah, we're going to come back to you and to this point of money, I'm sure, uh, 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 quite a lot. So uh, you, you already provided uh, one of the keywords, I think, of this, uh, of this panel today. So thank you, thank you for that. Um, so Helge, I remember the first year that you started um, as managing director at the Film von Hamburg Schleswig-Holstein, now Moin Film von Hamburg Schleswig-Holstein. And we had a meeting with the like, artistic director Linda at the time in Cannes and talked about like possible topics what we could do at the industry event in this year, it was 2019. And then we said like, yeah, um, I was really inspired by colleagues in the French industry who were working in the 50-50 by 2020 initiative on like gender equality. And we talked about like, let's do something on gender equality. And I remember that you at the time said kind of like, yeah, um, that's maybe not just limited to gender equality. I think it's really important to open this up and to see gender equality and like men, women, like balance in like all roles as a first step and really talk about diversity more. And so we didn't at the time do an event on this and uh, I'm very happy that now we are and that you're here and that there has quite a lot happened uh, in Hamburg and that you initiated. And so welcome and uh, I'll hand over to you and uh, maybe you can tell us a bit more about what happened, the diversity checklist, internal, uh, efforts that you're making in the film fund, whatever is uh, <coughs> is burning on your mind. I, I can describe it a little bit more. I mean, maybe we pick up from that point from May 19 or something in, yeah. in Cannes. So um, the, the way we uh, and at the fund approach diversity was, um, let's say, from from a more holistic point of view, um, starting at organizational level. First of all, I mean. Um, Indeed, I think the, the most visible element at the moment and the most discussed element is the diversity checklist that we introduced. But in fact, that was the last step we took uh, for the time being, obviously. So um, the, the way we started to approach diversity in the fund, in the organization, was to uh, go through an internal process of you know, um, defining who we are as a fund, who we would like to be, for whom, what are the core values of the fund, so, and, and that's, that was a pretty long process. I mean, and, um, I don't know if that translates well in light build. Uh, I think it's one of those German English words yeah. that translates, right? And so we, we worked on, on designing a light build and, and, and that's, a, that's a process that involves the whole 
a or light maybe, light build now light build, yeah. Yeah. so like a, like guiding principles in yeah a guiding world. principles yeah. so like um, you know yeah. mm -hmm. Overall, overarching principle of, of what, what are the core principles we want to work on, and that sort of from from that point on, if, if once once you define for yourself as an organization that that you have certain principles that you don't want to, you know, undermine, that triggers uh, um, some consequences, obviously. So, for us as a fund, it's very important to understand how do we distribute money, and how do we open up uh, access to money. So we looked into organization. We um, had throughout that process that lasted for about a year. Um, from we, we had a, a two-day workshop with the, the entire um, fund. Then had a working group that worked, you know, over a longer period of time to, to work out some of the key principles and always picked up on the company. Um, uh, we installed a working group within the fund that met once a week to discuss diversity only, to look into different models that exist already. Uh, we looked into language, the use of language, what are the principles of language in the fund. Um, we, used, uh, we looked into recruiting, how can we get better in recruiting. And we still do look into all these topics um, because I, I believe only when we as a fund have a certain, certain base to work from, we, we are in a position to ask our applicants to, to you know, adhere to sim similar principles. So that's one step is sort of on an organizational level. The next level is the decision-making level. So uh, when we introduced our new funding guidelines, we also introduced new, um, new juries. And the composition of those juries uh, was in fact quite a shift from how we worked before. Mm -hmm. uh, we try to have very diverse backgrounds represented in those juries, which is, Challenging, obviously, because we all know the shortcomings in the industry. We, in, at the Film Fund Hamburg, we only have uh, professional juries, so you need professionals who have a very high professional level and understanding. At the same time, can you know join from very different backgrounds and so on. So and and they need to be available. We also up the number of sessions, by the way, and so on. We had some mm -hmm. some other changes that made yeah. it more challenging, but you know, uh, bottom line is we we made and created more diverse juries. And then last but not least, we also introduced the, the um, diversity checklist, which is sort of the, the shop front element, if you want, for diversity for our applicants and uh, asks very simple questions in terms of diversity in front of the camera and uh, structurally behind the camera. Uh, and that we developed together with uh, in two universities, um, Universität Rostock and Film University in Babelsberg, as well as uh, the Scriptwriters Association yeah. and um, Aktion Mensch, and, and so we, we joined forces with a couple of partner organizations to, to you know, get as close to what we believe is the right thing to do. And that's in place now since June 2020, so we have a little bit more than one year of practice and learning in that field. Mm -hmm. We understand how much and how little at the same time it you know, so influences the decision-making yeah. process. And everything else is, is part of the learning curve that we are still in. So we are still looking into how to improve that and so on. And this diversity checklist, I mean, maybe we can have a quick look at, like, the, I have, like, there's three of them, right? There's one for development, one for production, and one for distribution. Mm. Like, this should magically maybe disappear on the screen now, just to have mm. a quick look at what we're talking about. So we're going to see it here. It's very small for us here in the, uh, in the oh, no, it's not that small anymore. Um, so uh, something I wanted to say in the beginning, and I totally forgot because I was so excited, is that everything that we're showing and that we're looking at today, I'm very happy to send everybody by email so you don't have to like, write down everything or you can find all this online, of course, but I'm happy to like, send you the, uh, the, um, the, all the materials and all the information that you need. Um, if we just scroll down this a bit, uh, a bit uh, I, what I found really interesting is like, so this is a voluntary information, right, that people have to give? No. That, no, they have to you answer, it, but well, like yes, what they two answer. Ways, two ways of looking at it. Yes. It's, it's a mandatory item if you apply for funding. So we, we. So you have to answer the questions. Everybody has to answer questions, but can you can opt page? out in certain questions. If yeah. you don't want to answer certain questions, you're, you're free to not answer questions if you don't feel. Yeah. Can like we go to the second page with the questions maybe that we just see? Yeah, so, um, so 
There is a lot of questions, so you basically have to answer most of them, and then there are like a few where you can opt out. But everybody has to fill this out if they want to apply for funding with you. So That's it. Okay, good. I find this really interesting um, because it uh, addresses like, uh, like categories of diversity in this, like what we're seeing here. And this is one of the things like that I was asking myself when I prepared for the story. So what categories like do we count and uh, and how do we develop this and what's okay. the definition of diversity and i found this really interesting what you're addressing in here now and we're going to come to a different example from a different country as well and i think it's interesting also to see that we might not all have the same definition of diversity as well this is based on on the legal basis we're working from there's in the so-called gleichstellungsgesetz the law that the equality law let's say um, it's yeah. called and that defines certain categories of, of diversity so it's not you know we didn't make this up this is sort of based on on the legal outset and then obviously we, we looked into the more film specific um, specificities yeah yeah great um I would be really interested in knowing a bit more about what you said about the juries I think like the decision making like institutional levels are of course not as diverse. I mean, just standing here, us five for now, you can see that we're not very diverse. Like, of course, in the preparation, I talked to a lot of people and we had like colleagues from the film institutes with a different background as well. In the end, we ended up with Helen as the only like person that's read as a female or as a woman uh, and us um, white European educated background. And this is all assumptions. This is also like, I'm assuming everybody is identifying as a man. Of course, when you come to diversity, it also goes into identity politics and it gets maybe complicated. So I had a moment where I was, always, I was feeling really bad about like, can I have a panel on diversity? And then it's just us like five European white people standing here. Um, but how do I get around this? Am I trying desperately to find people who like will represent diversity? Isn't that tokenism? I, a lot of like um, what's coming up feels complicated to me also. I was like today or the last days when I started preparing the panel, I was getting really nervous about it, how we're gonna be here. But I think this is also nice to just acknowledge it that it's not like an easy conversation necessarily to have always because when we talk about diversity, um, we talk about racism, we talk about sexism, we talk about misogyny and, uh, and to address this and to like make also like our discomfort with these discussions uh, as part of the topics and also that like the higher you come in, deci in decision categories and structures, the less diverse we maybe still are. But this is about to change and changing and I find it interesting that like in the juries or in the boards that make the decisions on the projects, you're already like putting an emphasis on coming to a more diverse representation there. And also with like colleagues, when you, when you find new colleagues or look for new colleagues, you kind of follow the same principles or guidelines that you ask people to apply to their projects, right? We do, um, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and and I, I think there's a lot to gain, obviously, from yeah. that. I mean, you know, that said, I mean, I think the, the Hamburg Film Fund was run by women mm. uh, for 20 years or so. So and this is, you know, it can also shift in, in different directions. But I think to, to notice in general, I mean, the, the fact that you are noticing that exactly that, you know, three white guys and mm. uh, a woman, also white, is not the ideal standard um, is, is one first step to notice. And yeah. then, you know, moving out of your comfort zone is the next step. Yeah. And um, be, I mean, you can, in fact, be in, in very uncomfortable situations once in a while. It, it can happen. And that's also part of the discussion. It's exactly part of what, what yeah. the diversity journey is, I think. And yeah. um, let's move on to Helen next. Helen promised not to change her sex uh, before the, uh, after the test we did this morning to not fully embarrass me to just stand with men here. So she's representing at least a female perspective. Uh, Helen, welcome very much to the panel. Um, so Helen Arsen is film commissioner, moving Sweden and international co-productions at the Swedish Film Institute. Did I say that right? I was uh, practicing, yeah. Um, Helen, uh, the uh, report, which women especially, that you published, I think last year, uh, and I think you have it in your hands, we also have it as a file, but it's even nicer that you can show that you brought this to your holidays in Spain. That's real dedication to show it into the camera. Um, this was one of really the, the starting points for this discussion, where we said, like, let's not just talk about like, gender balance and gender equality, but in this report, you also address questions, okay, so the women that we are looking at, they might be differently uh, discriminated. There is like age, there's racialization, there's like different categories. 
uh, where, where we come to a point that not all women are equal, of course not. And looking at this was really one of the inspirational points that we started to talk about this panel. So um, yeah, I'll just give this over to you and maybe you can tell us a bit more about the report, about the work that you've been doing at the Swedish Film Institute. Um, with Anna Serna, of course, you've been like really at the forefront of like the gender uh, equality debate for like many years now. So um, yeah, welcome Helen and maybe just uh, share with us a bit. Oh, well, thank you so much. Uh, these questions are very close to our hearts, of course. And uh, uh, I'm sure everyone knows that uh, Anna is unfortunately not with us any longer as our uh, CEO. And we are very curious uh, who will be our new, and nobody knows, uh, maybe our board knows, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, for sure next year in the beginning, we will have a new person in place. Uh, but I think it's very important to have a passionate uh, leader. But I also want to mention on the Swedish side, it's always been um, encouraged also by our government. Uh, these topics. So uh, actually, we've been working with gender equality, just as you mentioned already back in, in the beginning of uh, 2000. And I was going back uh, scrunching numbers and uh, we did a script competition already in 2014 called Black mm -hmm. is the New Black with uh, a colleague uh, back then to me, um, Baker Karim, who then was a film commissioner and black of color. Uh, so we, we have been struggling with these questions for a while, but it's still, uh, we're not uh, pleased uh, with the figures and the situation, of course. So it's still a lot of hard work that has to be done. And the report uh, you were mentioning and that I just showed, um, that's our latest report and uh, uh, it's like 50 pages and I know it's very good that you will send the links to them who are more interested and want to go deeper. Uh, but it's really depressing <laughs> to read the result and uh, it's, it was done with in-depth interviews with 19 directors and actors. And um, we really try to have an intersectional perspective on this, um, gender, age, uh, and, uh, and really talking about all this uh, racist mechanism, how, how to say. And uh, in, in the end of it, uh, there's a summary, and I will just glance through just shortly some of the uh, headlines there, just to have a... Um, wider idea of and of course uh, Kalle from our Danish friend al already spotted um, the important question of money and uh, we can really see that smaller budgets result in smaller film projects and women generally uh, receive lower budgets than men as female stories are seen as narrow fil films entailing a greater financial risks and this in turn guides financial expectations where statistics indicate a correlation between larger film budgets and lar lar larger audiences. So you can see you're like, you get double punishment. First you're a, a woman and you get lower expectations. And because of that, you get a smaller budget. Uh, and because of that, you will not reach uh, the audience potential that your story originally uh, might have. Uh, another thing that was really important here was talking about... Uh, the, you can wait with this, Lorraine, a bit. Yeah. You, yeah please yeah. wait with that slide. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and another uh, thing was um, uh, that uh, when the... Swedish film industry in uh, talking about these topics are not professional. It really creates a, a, it's like a time thief. So work environments, uh, when you have violations or discrimination, uh, is really a risk when it turns uh, not so professional in the sense that energy goes to addressing various forms of uh, misbehaviors uh, and it will really steal focus from the work uh, that you should 
be able to focus on. Um, and also in the end, time then means it steals money from the production. And also we all know that we have very much a freelance situation and then it's also more tough um, when you're not uh, safe at, uh, at on set, for example. And that has really, we have this culture of silence, even though this report was done two years after the Me Too explosion, still uh, these women were deeply uh, in, uh, interviewed in deep, uh, depth, uh, really uh, feel uh, um, not fair treated. Mm -hmm. And uh, another subject I think is interesting that these women often feel that they also have to be the diversity expert, uh, uh, both in development or in the production phase or also in um, when it's time to release the film. Mm -hmm. And that also uh, can actually be a risk of ex 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 <laughs> was a burnouts. Mm -hmm. uh, because you can't focus on, on the role or, or the performance or, or directing. You also have to all the time uh, be the diversity expert of the team, so to speak. So I will just stop there with a the summary. There are some more uh -huh. conclusions, of course, yeah. but just to get, I think maybe this was useful for you and the discussion yeah. maybe, sure. hopefully. I think what's really interesting is a point that you mentioned. Usually when we talk about diversity on set or in production, it, it's presented as a problem. It's presented as something you need to do extra and it's going to cost you more money and it's going to be like lots of work. But I found it really interesting that what you're saying, as I understand it, is that also like creating this environment and a more diverse industry also helps like to create a better atmosphere in which we can work better maybe. Like this like positive turn of like understanding that like maybe this culture of silence, this culture of like uh, sexual violence on set, this culture of like danger, that culture of like like supremacy, like white supremacy, straight supremacy, like in different aspects, that does actually not help like making films in a good and efficient and pleasant and successful way also artistically. This is something I think really to see that uh, this is not like an extra like annoying thing that we have to do, but this is maybe like a change of the culture of filmmaking for the better that also helps like create like better conditions for all us to all of us to work in um, is I think a very important and interesting point. Definitely. And uh, so these reports really gave, a, gave us a lot of information and then of course we are not so fun of just talking uh, at the SFI. We really like action, and uh, when we maybe later in the in the panel, I would really like to inform you of the latest news uh, for talent to watch. Yes. That actually was one of the last great things Anna did before quitting. Mm -hmm. uh, how she uh, gave us five million extra euros for new voices, but I can go back to that mm -hmm. and. Uh, and I can. I would love to talk about some more uh, positive notes. Uh, and I don't. I don't want to end on this depressing <laughs> quotes. Um, <laughs> but uh, let's bring in some more white men first. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so Anders, welcome on the panel. Anders, you're head of development and audience at the Norwegian Film Institute. And you have a background as a producer as well. Um, we're very pleased that you could join us on the panel. Can you hear us OK? Yeah, yeah. I can. Yeah. Um, I want to give a quick shout out to your colleague Aisha Ula, who's like the project manager for App, App 2.0. Uh, she was recommended by the Media Network. And uh, we were very happy that she, uh, I had a talk with her. Like That was very inspiring. Unfortunately, she couldn't be here, so you kindly stepped in to represent the Norwegian Film Institute. Um, what I find really interesting is that um, there's another way of like not just looking at problems and things we don't have that you seem to do in Norway, but to kind of really address like ways, how can we, if we don't have the people that we need to have like to work in all positions in the, in the film industry uh, from diverse backgrounds, can we help like people to develop? Like, can we do like talent development? Can we bring people from underrepresented groups into the industry and how can we do this? I think this is something that we're gonna come back to in different contexts as well. But like up 2.0, um, there is a lot of interesting information out there about the program and I'm gonna share that with everybody as well. But I just want to give a special shout out to that before now leaving you to 
tell us uh, if that's your main concern. What are you in Norway discussing and just sharing with us like your perspective? Well, I have to say, first of all, uh, this is sometimes I feel we are talking about uh, this is something among us, you know, this is, uh, it's, I hear my own voice uh, in the return area, but this is actually happening now, and uh, it's, it's something, it's among us, people's stories, you know. So what we are talking about today is, I hear my voice. Is there something you can... Just feed the feedback. I don't know. Maybe if, you, if you try to put the headphones in again, I think that was like a bit better maybe than we did the yeah, test. Yeah, I have another machine. Ah. Uh, yeah, I can just try, I can try. Sorry about that. We're, we're going to turn it down here as much as we can to avoid that, but yeah, you, no, this okay. is the, the dangers so of the I, hybrid I format. We have to start, I mean, this is stories and the people among us that is part of our society, and I think this is so important to to tell the stories that are there and the um, society, you know, and uh, that's the thing to, for television. In many years, I produce a lot of Netflix stories, uh, series for NRK, and this is a part of uh, the issue we, we have every day, you know, and in, in the stories. I think uh, so much happened back in 2019 in the Norwegian Film Institute. We are known for our action for inclusion and especially in the Norwegian film and culture. Uh, and what we have to do is that uh, we have to break the recruit more diverse institutions and high power roles and the incentives in the industry. Uh, in the so, what we have to do is stop the hotel. So I just uh, hired um, diversity in uh, in role commissioner mm -hmm. uh, for our new talent programs and feature film, and our new uh, talent uh, head of talent is also um, uh, into diversity, you know, um, and um, we have to get a better data map in order to have the targets for our if you wanted to fight uh, the targets, and we have conversations going, we are seminars, education initiative, we mm -hmm. do not have the experiences, sometimes needed to probably understand difficulties, the minority filmmaker experience, yeah. and we have to ed uh, educate ourselves. Yeah. We, we have, uh, we have a slight, we sorry to interrupt you, Anders, we have a slight problem of hearing, sorry to interrupt you, we have a slight problem of hearing yeah. everything like uh, that you're saying like very clearly, but uh, what I wanted to well, sum I, up. I, I hear myself, like, so I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the sound connection is not ideal, I'm sorry about that, but what I wanted to sum up from what I heard, heard what you said is that in 2019 at the Film Institute, you announced the action plan for inclusion, inclusion and diversity in the Norwegian film and culture. Uh, I'm happy to share that as well. And what I found really interesting in this plan is that uh, coming back to categories, like of like what makes diversity, what categories are we looking at? Um, your categories were including a lot of the categories that you also had in the industry in the in, in the checklist. But you also had like uh, something that in Germany we don't have that much. You had in, indigenous people and you have national minorities in your program. And I found this like a really important and interesting point that we in Germany don't really have like indigenous minorities or national minorities, but in Norway and I think in some of the other countries, it's not, uh, there is like another aspect added um, that also includes geographical locations, so people outside of the big cities and the big centers, and includes indigenous people and national minorities. I found that a really interesting point. Um, Helen, I, I saw that you wanted to add something to that. I'll just give it quickly back to Anders if he wanted to add something on that before I come to you. You ask me, no, I, I just have to say this is part of our society today, you know, and uh, it reflects a lot of businesses, people in film and TV. You know? And uh, I just uh, lived in America for years and, and I've seen this uh, problem close, you know, and, in, and also what it can do if you want to do it. And, and if you see what the Americans is doing, it's so interesting to see you know, how they bring in into the stories 
and into the culture because uh, it reflects only the society we live in. Yeah. And uh, and uh, this discussion is how we can try to include this so this like normal for everybody. Yeah. And uh, it's 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 really important, you know. I just I'm so sorry. I just hear myself. It's fine. Maybe you can try again with headphones. I'm going to go back to Helen and we're going to yeah. try and fix the sound issues. We hear you, but also like the, the mice on steroids sound is maybe a bit back that we experienced with Helen in the beginning, so I'm sorry about that. But Helen, you wanted to add something to, to this? Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, can, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Okay, great. <laughs> Uh, I just wanted to add uh, what uh, my dear uh, Norwegian co colleague was stressing here, that uh, actually in Sweden we also have national minorities and indigenous yeah. people. And actually uh, one out of ten in Sweden defines themselves to one of our five uh, official national minorities. And uh, we also have a strategy, uh, strategy uh, to strengthen film pr production especially uh, aiming for children and youth uh, on the national minority languages, but also for adults, of course. I mm -hmm. just want to yeah. add this uh, perspective is very important for us as well, and, and maybe not so, so well known. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I would propose as the next step, we heard from all of you a bit, and I think it opened up a few aspects that we really can discuss a bit further on. So how do we define uh, diversity? Which categories are we actually looking at? And how do we make sure that we identify people that like represent like groups that are underrepresented in the film industry, in both like the stories, but also the creator side and the audience side as well. Um, how do we identify these? There's issues also like you said, some things you cannot legally ask a person necessarily, like you cannot make a list of people based on their sexual identity. Um, so these are, I think, aspects like that are challenging. And if you go beyond that, how do you actually find people to work in these positions that you need them to work in if they're not there? So how are you looking for them? Where are you going? How are you educating people? How are you addressing um, like systems like film schools or like internships or also like uh, the social background of allowing people to work in like very badly paid internships to uh, yeah, have parents that support them maybe economic background I think is an important part as well and um, so this opens up quite a lot of discussions what I really would like to do is to bring the first of our producers uh, here because we have three producers and filmmakers um, that I want to add to the discussion and um, we're going to have a quick look at the trailer of the first film and this uh, is to introduce uh, Geraldine Sprimont who's the co-producer of the Swedish film Clara Sola by Nathalie alvarez Messen. and uh, this is playing in the festival here as well and uh, I propose we just have a look at the trailer together and then we're going to bring Geraldine onto the panel. Bueno, ya yo le dije, doctora, que yo operación no quiero. Por una cirugía, usted le va a dar mejor calidad de vida, Clara. Dios me la mandó así, así yo me la voy a dejar. Así, como una ola. Mamá dice que todos tenemos que trabajar. ¿Y usted en qué trabaja? ¿Qué hace? Ma dice que trabajo para Dios. Clarita, denle la bendición al Señor. Ya. ¿Y usted cree en la vida? Puedo hacer lo que me dé la gana. Patas de cabra. Clara, conviértase en algo. A ver, escuche. Santa María, ruega por nosotros. Cura a todos los que tienen el corazón enfermo. Cura a todos los que no tienen razón. 
Geraldine, welcome to the panel. When I talked with Thomas Heiler, our artistic director, about the panel and about like what we want to do, one of the things that really came to our attention was that the films that we're showing here in Lübeck at the festival this year represent like a larger diversity in the terms of content, I think, than ever before. And Clara Sola was definitely one of the titles that came to our mind, like a very strong female vision, a director that's like uh, based in is Swedish, but not like the typical Swedish film, if you want to call it that. Um, a beautiful and very strong and very different uh, protagonist in the film. Uh, the film is a co-production between Sweden uh, and also the producer Nima has like a Iranian Swedish background so there is like diversity in the creator side at least to some extent. Um, you co-produced from Belgium with a German co-producer as well who couldn't be here unfortunately yet. Um, but we're very pleased to have you here and um, yeah I just want to hear from you how important was like aspects of diversity for you when you get involved in the project? How did you choose to come involved in this project? And uh, what was the, what was the, yeah, what draw you, drew you to the project? Uh, thank you for, for taking me here. I'm very nice to, to talk about this. Clara Sola is a project we are very proud of and uh, it's definitely the project to talk about diversity, I think. Uh, female director, female actress, non-actress actually. Uh, this is also one, one of the aspects of diversity in this film. Uh, I have met Nima and Clara Sola in uh, Eave Puentes, which is a producer's workshop uh, that uh, focus on co-production between uh, Europe and Latin America. Uh, and we have followed the path of Clara Sola from then. It was in 2015, if I remember well. And uh, yes, the story of Clara is definitely very strong uh, at Need Productions, uh, so my production company, We Are Women, and we uh, follow uh, yes projects that promote this kind of vision of the world. We have also produced Felicité by Alain Gomis, also a story of women uh, that was taking place in, uh, in Kinshasa. Mm -hmm. We have produced uh, Nuestras Madres, shot in Guatemala. We are producing now with uh, Jean de Forêt and also uh, people from Holland and Morocco, uh, Queens, that is the story of women in Morocco that are also <laughs> breaking the chain. So this is topics that we are trying to push to the publics. Uh, so Clara, of course, we, we were very happy. I would say that uh, what is also specific on this project, it's uh, the co-production scheme. As mm -hmm. you told, it's a co-production between Sweden, Belgium, Germany, Costa Rica, and even the US. And we need to bring five countries together to make this film possible and to reach a not so high budget as Ellen told. Mm -hmm. uh, that's definitely the case because all the projects I told before, Felicité, Nuestras Madres, and so on, all those films are below uh, 1.5 million. Mm -hmm. So definitely it also uh, brings the light on what Ellen was talking about. Mm -hmm. So. Yes, the co-production scheme is very important also because it's all those countries uh, together that can really push this kind of stories to the public. And, uh, and I think it's, it's yes, uh, very important. Mm -hmm. yes. Was it important for you because the character of Clara Sola as a protagonist is also a really diverse character in her physicality, but she was played by an actress that was, I think, like able-bodied, if you want to call it this. Was that ever a discussion like to represent someone in like their physicality um, by, by like someone who has like really like a different shaped body or was that never an issue? I want to come to the point, there's often the point that you say like, like disabled people or people with like different bodies should not be played by people that are able to, queer people shouldn't be played by straight people. Uh, I mean we're not like talking about black people shouldn't be played by white people anymore thankfully. But uh, like this idea of like not only making stories about us but with us was like the physicality of the protagonist ever like a discussion in, the, in terms of diversity between all of you? Uh, yes, just because the only person we found to play the role of Clara was a dancer actually. Mm -hmm. Because it's true that uh, uh, she has a physical 
specific aspect of uh, of behavior and and it, it was not so easy to find someone and and definitely the the, the wendy who is the the leading protagonist uh, is a dancer and she was the only one and natalie has a uh, let's say funny way of uh, working with uh, with wendy because when she cast uh, wendy she said nothing about the film uh, nothing about the role nothing she just uh, Natalie is a, a pro mime, so yeah. that you know, mm -hmm. and uh, and she tells Wendy, okay, now act like if you are one hundred percent a wolf, and then she decreased the percentage of animal behavior mm -hmm. in the personage uh, in the character of Clara, to end at okay, now you are twenty percent a wolf, eighty percent mm -hmm. a human, and that's how she succeeded to to bring like the kind of uh, behave physic, but also like animal aspect of the character yeah. linked to the nature and so on. Yeah, I mean, I think this is really for me like one of the questions of intersectionality that was mentioned already by someone that, of course, there's like different aspects of diversity and they come together in certain projects. But also, I don't think we should like um, come to a point where artistic intentions and like an artistic vision uh, is like fully controlled by just like ticking boxes. I mean, this is a discussion I think that people who are afraid of like quotas or who are afraid of like checklists like often have. But uh, to me, I mean, like in the panel, in a panel that I watched uh, on, that was in Hamburg at the festival, Helge, where you were present as well, um, on the use of an inclusion writer for like a production, there was like a big discussion about like, is this actually like damaging our artistic filmmaking? Or is this something that we need kind of like a crutch until we come to a point where like inclusion and diversity is something that's more natural? Um, so I think like finding this balance between like, asking for something or like asking to check certain boxes because we need to check certain boxes to come to a more inclusive and more diverse uh, um, reality of representation but still like having of course the freedom for like a female filmmaker from sweden with costa rican like so like origin or history or roots that's the word i was looking for and um, to tell a story uh, like this, I think, is a beautiful example of, of a project that, that ticks a lot of the boxes that we want to tick. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, I, don't, I don't think there's a, there's a contradiction between checking about diversity into a project <coughs> and creative freedom. I think creative freedom is, is um, I mean, that, that's a bottom line anyway. Um, but we need to, under, and, and there's, you know, if, if you want to make a film, you have to go against so many risks and, and so many, you have to, you know, if you're afraid of, a list and think that a list infringes your your creative freedom. Good luck with making a really outstanding film. I mean, this, you have to <laughs> overcome so much more than a list to check boxes. Then I, I'm, yeah. <laughs> uh, if, if that hurdle can't be taken and you can't also defend your vision, of course. I mean, yeah, maybe you have to position yourselves against certain um, positions, and then that's also part of diversity to to have that discussion and to to have a certain stand. I mean, we are absolutely open to fund films that are 100% white. Mm if we understand why and if we understand how the characters approached, if we understand how cliches are approached and are, you know, um, the, the sort of the vibrations in the film go against the grain and so on. But we need to understand that there's an idea about diversity and that there's an, an, an inherent understanding of, of the world we live in nowadays. And um, yeah, maybe I'll stop there, but yeah. that's, I, I don't see that yeah. contradiction yeah. at all. And, and um, I, I see a certain quality in even even the opposite side, I think we can enhance quality mm -hmm. by it. Yeah. Did someone else from the screen people wanted to react to this? Maybe it's a bit uh, harder to include you here because you're not physically standing there, Helen. Yes. Oh, first of all, uh, uh, well done on the Belgium side with the. <laughs> Thank you. Co-production, <laughs> and uh, since I'm also. Uh, uh, the Film Commissioner for International Co-Production, I think really we can also here make a change, as a positive change as Film Commissioners, because there, there are some really interesting, uh, ambitious uh, producer around the world, as Geraldine here, and, and you can really push collaborations and new perspectives and stories uh, by helping uh, through co-production. So I just say, well done. <laughs> Thank you.
<laughs> in Belgium, we are trying to do this also because you were talking about the jury uh, before. Uh, in Belgium, it's not exactly the same. There is not one film commissioner. It's a film commission with hundreds of people coming from different uh, fields of cinema, like authors, actors, technicians, uh, journalists, uh, teachers, producers, distrib distributors. And uh, it helps to bring also uh, diversity in, in the film that, uh, that the Film Commission in Belgium uh, decide to, to, yes, to found. And it's, mm. uh, it's, uh, yeah, it has been changed, like, I think, one year ago now. And, uh, and we feel that uh, it's, it has a very positive impact. Yes, really. Yeah, yeah. And one last question, maybe, before I invite the next producer. Ah, sorry, Kalle wants to say something. Sorry. Thanks, Helge. Yeah, just uh, I wanted to. I saw Klaas Sola at at uh, Cannes, and it was absolutely the best movie I saw in Cannes. And it was it's just an amazing movie. But what I realized when, as the commissioner, is like I, I we I realized that actually it put a spot on a, an issue or discussion we have at the institute right now is the the um, the origin of of, the, of language because. Um, we are still struggling with some kind of a, um, how would I call old school thinking about you know the, that a picture in a Danish picture should be in Danish. And when I saw this picture, it was like you know this could have been you know uh, I, I, the first you think oh this is an, an um, South, Amer uh, South American picture or something, but. What I realized is that we, if we want to give the voices to, um, for example, the 13% uh, uh, um, of ethnic minorities in Denmark, uh, we cannot only tell them, okay, but we only, we, you, they have like two languages, they have like a, a past and something that, you know, they meet in the Danish society that is, you know, it, strictly Danish ethnic culture. And they have a different culture bringing into it. But what, what uh, there's a structural problem if we tell them mm, we only want to hear one of your voices. You should like you split in two as a person, and we only want to hear from the voice or the language or the culture that is what we we would say is Danish. And um, uh, we have been discussing that. Uh, um, uh, from that point of view, and Klaus Ola was kind of a, an eye opener. So thank you very much for that, because it, 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 there's always these little things in in a system like the the the, the, the institutes or, or the uh, when you have systems that are built up from scratch uh, from from over a long time, and you'll have these little pieces that actually works against if you want to put change into something. And this was a thing that we now have discussion about, like, is a Danish movie a movie in Danish, uh, the Danish language, or can it be uh, in, a, in, a, in another language than in Danish? Add to yes. that. Thanks, Kalle. Helen, I think you wanted to, you gave a sign that you wanted to add something to that. Uh, yes, uh, please. Uh, uh, I just want to uh, also underline that uh, I know the whole team uh, with Clara Sola really had a super tough time. Uh, so we just not get, oh, Sweden are so great. Sweden are the best. Definitely not. I uh, just wanted to uh, uh, also uh, be a bit moderate here. I, I really know uh, Nima, the, the main producer, had a really tough time uh, developing and and financing together with all the great co-producers. I think that it took them five years or so. And I've, I've been following this creative team thanks to another talent scheme we have called Wildcard uh, that is really aimed to be a, like a mega boost uh, when you graduate from film school. And when, when Natalie uh, graduated from film school in the US, uh, she applied for this um, development support Wildcard and 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 she was one of the winners because she's such a great storyteller and such a unique voice and i really recommend her exam film as well if you love clara sola you will uh, f immediately fall in love with that film as well and uh, and uh, <clears throat> when when we talked to nima and natalie they were so released you can really see their 
whole body uh, relax uh, because they got on a flat, like, like a flat fee, uh, 40,000 euros just to develop their next project. Uh, that will be Natalie's second feature. And they were like, oh, hopefully next project will not take five years. <laughs> yes, so when yeah. we speak to diversity <laughs> and all this, we, we really have to, to stress that it's so much uh, that we have to show the new talent trust and show them the money. I think that's really what they need. They need the, the develop, quick development money and uh, to move on with their next project as well, because it's tough to do your first feature, but it's also often the case that it's very tough to do the second film. So I just want to uh, put a bit n nuance to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. That's very welcome. Um, we're going to move. Thank you so much, Geraldine, for being on the panel with us. Yes, I'm going to spray and disinfect this very professionally. I tried to hide the bottle, but I have to spray it anyway. So um, We learned that hand infection is not a problem. It's really the aerosols that you get when you speak into it. So they uh, told me this is safe now again for the next person coming on the panel. And we're going to have a look at the trailer. I'm very happy to welcome Eva Beling, the producer and director of Prejudice and Pride, Swedish film Queer, with us. But let's first have a look at the trailer of the film. Vingina. Is that how it's pronounced? Uh, wings uh, is the first queer film. ögonen på oss från hela världen. Vi hade inte ens börjat filma. A lot of lesbian history isn't and couldn't have been documented and couldn't even been spoken in the kind of oral history form. Hon vill vara sann mot sig själv. Alltså hon gör markeringar som man bara fattar om man är in the know. Greta Garbo was a lesbian. And the thought that she could be a lesbian and tarnish her iconic status somewhat might be a little frightening to people. Ingmar var nog mer stängt på detta än jag. Det är liksom så det var och det är nog lätt att glömma bort. Vad vågar vi stå för själva och säga det ska du ge fan i? Så här är jag och jag tycker för övrigt inte om dig heller så det är bra med det. Om vi tittar nu på Pride och HBTQ-rörelsen så visade han ju upp den i mitten på 70-talet. Vi vill gå till alltid före sin tid. Tillsammans är vi starka. Tillsammans är vi en makt. Och vem kan avvisa oss då? För en skådespelares stora uppgift är ju detta. Att leva sig in i allt möjligt mänskligt. Där ingår det här också. Könet eller vad vi nu ska kalla det. There was a, a, a queer presence that one doesn't necessarily find in other national cinemas. And that goes back all the way to the first two decades of, of the history of cinema with that Swedish film. Thank you so much. Oh. Welcome on the panel, Eva. <laughs> I could just start to say that this is actually my pitch for the whole film. This was actually the pitch that he used also to finance the film? Yes, yeah. because the uh, first time I, I went to the Swedish Film Institute and I said I would like to do this idea and it was on paper. 
and they looked at it and they saw lots of films and they didn't really understand the subject mm -hmm. and, uh, and she said, well, you know, I don't understand the, the queer here, what's queer about the classic comedies <laughs> in Sweden. And she said, no, thank you. Uh, and I went back and I went to a friend of mine and said, what shall I do? Uh, go back, go back. <laughs> so I went back and I said, please give me some money to do a trailer mm -hmm. and I'll show you what, what I want to do. And she said, okay. Uh, finally, she, uh, she agreed to give me some money for the trailer. So that's the trailer. <laughs> right. So we're, we're moving from fiction to documentary and we're moving yes. to like an historic exploration of like an out aspect of LGBTQ history yes. in the Swedish film history. When we had a preparation talk, you said like, you think every country should have a film like this exploring like this underlying history of representation or lack of representation or misrepresentation like of like identities, uh, LGBTQ identities in their film history. Very few have, I think. So uh, how did you come to, to make the story, to, to tell this story, to analyze this history? Uh, because, uh, I, when I, was, I, uh, I got the idea to the film uh, by uh, a colleague of mine, and I had to do a lot of research myself, actually, uh, to look at, I think I looked at 150 films, uh, to, to, to look at things that I usually not look at <laughs> or search for. Um, so uh, it was interesting when we when we um, uh, when we played the film yesterday here at mm -hmm. premiere at the film festival. There was a woman in the in the audience who said, "I've seen all those films at Lübeck, <laughs> <laughs> but I've never thought about seeing them from this perspective." <laughs> so um, and that's that's the whole point, you know, to mm -hmm. to look at things, um, uh, to see a film and to analyze a film from a completely different perspective is very, very interesting. And the queer community is very good at that. <laughs> you know, they, they, um, they can, they, yeah, they look mm. with different eyeglasses. Yeah. So, yeah. so um, yeah, what was your question? <laughs> It was my question, what drew you to make this, this film and this exploration of the well, queer history of the cinema? I've always been interested in film. I've mm -hmm. done uh, lots of film. I've done uh, two portraits of Ingmar Bergman. I have done mm -hmm. a TV series with a legendary co uh, pro program host in Sweden. But uh, when I've never even thought about this, actually. To, uh, so I thought, of course, when I was uh, I got the idea, I was, oh my god, this is a fantastic idea. And also my background is from San Francisco State University. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I thought, of course. And I, I went to the uh, library and I saw those films and I also come to the conclusion that we have the first queer film in Sweden, mm -hmm. <laughs> Vienna. So that was also fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What I think is really interesting is that like documentaries, so non-fiction and fiction, like I'm sure there's a difference in like how like diversity is treated also in like structural support. Coming back also to the question of language that Kalle said before, like Denmark, for example, has like a long history of like producing documentaries and financing documentaries that are not about Denmark at all. Like if we think of the act of killing, the look of silence, documentaries like this, this whole like tradition of like documentary, politically engaged documentary filmmaking that is breaking out of national boundaries. This seems to be something that like in non-fiction films is maybe more accepted than in fiction films where there's more like of a national yeah. identity. Um, this goes a bit away from your yes. story, but it was just yeah. coming to my mind that like this difference in like how we treat fiction and non-fiction films um, in the funding system also when it comes to, to diversity um, is, is I think an aspect um, that, that we should explore a bit. It, does someone want to? to participate uh, to that. I mean, Kali, you're like a, in the fiction department, so I don't want to put you on the spot. It was just something that came to mind when you talked about language uh, and how, like, how, how to define a film. What is a Danish film? Um, what is a film from like a certain country? Um, but if anyone else wants to, to jump in or not, it's fine as well. That's a broad discussion. That, that, <laughs> it's a very it's, broad it's discussion. It's sort of a different discussion, yeah. if you ask me. Yeah, yeah. yeah Kali? Yeah, just uh, to follow up because you mentioned me. This is it's, it's, this is a discussion we has where we have as as well because uh, we travel a lot abroad with the ex exactly with the documentary and we can actually make a documentary about anything. Documentary has a certain speed to to uh, documentaries that more like a what do you say? 
the, the, the real mirror of, of, of what is out there, the society, the people in it. Um, so the reaction time on documentary, of course, is faster, I'd say, to put into to films. But in fiction, the funny thing is, we could actually just, you could put that on the fiction film and actually work work directly with it. But it, it's light because the fiction film is, we say it's 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 more, it's a it's a cooperation. It, it, it's it's people coming together with ideas. The photographer, di directors, writers, producers. It's more like um, it's it's a, they say it's more difficult. But I I don't actually buy that because um, I think that especially in just in this little house I work in, we have like is 30 meters away from me. The documentary department is doing what I would like to do. And, uh, but it's, uh, we're slowly getting there. Yeah, thank you. I think um, what I would like to ask you, do you think it would have been more difficult for you or easier for you to make a film that's not concerned with like a diverse topic like LGBTQ history of cinema? Would have been like, was this an advantage or like something that made the project more interesting or was it more challenging? I would say more challenging, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I was very enthusiastic mm -hmm. <laughs> in the beginning, and I was very positive and, and so on. And the uh, the uh, people that I interviewed were very positive, mm -hmm. and, and they had never had a question before, and so on. And they talked for hours. But then, when I was uh, actually starting to try to finance the film, I, I the obstacle was mm -hmm. coming, and uh, and there was a lot of no, thank you, and. But um, there was also, uh, you know, also some one person that gave me money, and mm -hmm. then uh, you get like, oh my god, okay, <laughs> it's not that bad. <laughs> so, so, but it was a challenge actually, mm -hmm. uh, because it's a it's a small film, also documentary, and and uh, but um, if, if the more they saw of it, you know, the more they saw coming what this is all about, they, they opened their <laughs> mm. wallet. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> they were back at money at this moment, mm. huh? They opened the wallet, so I'm glad they did, and I'm yeah. glad you're here to show the film in Lübeck with us. And um, yeah, we're jumping around quite a bit, which I think in diversity is like you can avoid it. There's lots of different aspects to it. So um, thank you so much, thank Eva, you. for being on the panel. Yes, thank and, you. Um, uh, does anyone want to react to something else or should we jump to the next trailer where we're going to go to? Yeah, Helen, you wanted to add something. Please do. I tried to keep it short, but I, I just want to say to Eva that I'm very happy that she was so stubborn as uh, often female film workers uh, have to be. And uh, also that uh, uh, like a teaser maybe for our next uh, next uh, uh, diversity report that will come next year. This is actually, I think, the first time we actually even mention what it will be about. We will really investigate uh, if there are differences and, and then why between uh, the developing and financing time. So how long does it take for female film directors, scriptwriters and producer, or uh, for male uh, when it comes to development and financing. And I think what Eva uh, talks about here very openly is uh, uh, something that will be inter interesting to see. Is it, is it the case that uh, female-driven projects uh, or diversity-driven projects takes longer time to convince uh, the money bags? Um, let's see. We're looking forward. Thanks for the exclusive like, little preview of the next report. We're all going to keep our eyes open for it. And um, with this, I'm going to introduce the last person coming on the panel with us. Uh, uh, we're going to start watching the trailer. And then I'm very happy to welcome uh, Kada Aideros Ahmed, the director of The Grave Digger's Wife from Finland with us. But let's have a look at the trailer first, please. <laughs> Yeah. 
Thank you. Uh, welcome, Kata, to the panel. Very happy to have you here. Thank you. We're coming back up. So just finally, uh, color, some color on the panel. Yeah, so finally, can... exactly. Yeah. Um, I was very happy to have you here. And we're coming back a bit to like what Klaus Sola maybe was like as a Swedish film, The Gravedigger's Wife is as a Finnish film. I read that you said you really wanted to make a Somali film and for you it is like a Somali film, like or you wanted to make it that way. Like uh, was that a big topic in the discussion in the funding as well for you? Like the language, the, like how do you justify this to as a Finnish production? Like maybe you can share a bit with us on, on how that process of uh, of producing and getting the money together for the film went. Um, thank you for having me here. Um, it hasn't been easy, and this film has been in the making for the past ten years, and it was mainly because of the funding. Mm. And you know, and I have been in the film industry for more than ten years, and this is actually the first publicly funded film that I have ever made. And so that says a lot mm. about the film institutes and you know inclusion and diversity. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> so yeah, and um, you know because you know the film commissioners have been very reluctant to fund um, a film, a Finnish film, spoken entirely in Somali and set in Africa. And uh, and that's why it took this, you know, uh, long to, to, to make the film. Yeah. I mean, I think this this brings us back a bit to what Kala also said that like, of course, there are like films with like diverse or like people from a migration background that are set in Finland. If we look at another film from Finland any day now, that was on quite a lot of like festivals as well, which tells the story of an Iranian family that that is deported back to Iran because they don't get like asylum. And um, this is a story that's maybe e more easily accepted as a Finnish film because it is set in Finland and people speak Finnish. But I think, yeah, like getting away from this definition of like what the nationality of a project is and coming to a broader term um, is something that is like a different kind of diversity maybe that like in Europe or in the Western world or us like with the money we finance stories and films that tell about like totally different parts of the world. And maybe it's not that important, like what the language and what the nationality and word is set is in the end. Yeah, yeah. Th I would assume that. Did, did you ever think about like going to a different project, to something set in Finland, to something that's like maybe easier in a way to, to finance? Um, you know, uh, this entire um, diversity and inclusion issue really it starts with the education, educational system mm. and it ends with the funding system. So if you don't let diversity, you know, in film schools, how can you expect to have, you know, diversity on set? Mm. That, that, that's the first question. I mean, you don't just expect somebody to draw from the sky and say like, hey, yo, are you looking for it already, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, black person, you know, or, or diversity. Um, I don't know about the statistics of um, Danish film school or, you know, Swedish film schools or Norwegian film schools, but I can confirm you that there has never been a black filmmaker in the Finnish film school, ever. Um, so, and I was the only black person in the entire crew of the film, the, the mm -hmm. only person. Um, 
and then there was uh, an another one from uh, uh, France. So, um, so if you don't really have, you know, diverse in these film schools, you don't have diverse, you know, um, on, on, on film sets, on TV sets. And, and then, if you don't have diversity on film institutions, you don't expect, you know, diverse stories to be made. Um, I, for example, had um, this uh, incident with, with, this, uh, with the Finnish film commissioner. So I wrote a short film set in Africa, mm -hmm. in Ethiopia. And there was another story set in Africa by a white film student. So he said, I have two stories set in Africa, one from an African perspective and one from a white perspective. So I, as a commissioner, I understand, because you know, the uh, Finnish white student's main character was a white woman. So he said, I relate more to this story. So I'm going to go with this one. And he went with that, fine. I wrote another story set in Finland with a Somali main character. Again, he said, I don't understand this, and this will never, you know, this story is impossible to make in, 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 in Finland. So I made that story, I made that film without funding. Mm -hmm. And the film went to film festivals and, and everywhere. And he later came to apologize to me for not believing me when he saw the finished film. So the Finnish, uh, I mean, the film commissioners also need to understand that not every story is for them because their countries are diverse. They need to also have to let those who are a part of the society tell their own stories from their own perspective so that they are yeah. all in one big society. Mm. But if you are exclusive and you only support those that you relate to or understand, then that's a problem. Yeah. I think that's a very important point that uh, like we also think about like audiences like who are these films being made for and like the representation like there's numbers in like different studies I'm not going to quote them all now but like how many people from like diverse backgrounds are shown in like TV series and in films and how many people actually live with us here in Europe like the numbers like are vastly apart so there's not at all like a just representation of like our realities in society in the media that we see. And uh, yeah, as you said, I think it's a very, very important point that we and the people who make the decisions come to an understanding and also see their own bias, as Carla said, that you kind of have to kind of like reflect on your own self, on, on, your, on your feelings of, uh, of white guilt or, or, of, or like white comfort also, where you don't have to face these problems because you pass as like the majority. Um, but yeah, I think there is like definitely development, but we're not there yet at all. And like the, ter the question of education and how to bring people into the industry to change this and to tell the stories and to make the stories uh, in a way that is more representative and more just and more yeah, really true to what we live in as a society, I think is, is very crucial. Uh, I'd love to like talk to Anders again if the sound is better, but I'm not really sure. Anders, can you did, you, did the sound work out a bit better with the headphones or? No, I tried, but uh, I uh, I never give up. But, uh, I'm so sorry. That's good. No, I sent not... you an email actually about it. So. I am um, not reading my emails right now, so. Um, yeah. I just no, want, I, know. <laughs> I just wanted to. I tried, but uh, all of my employees has been you know my it. Uh, people, it's, it's uh, going home, so I can't, it's, I'm so sorry. Yeah, it's not a problem at all. I could hear you a bit better. I just was really interested in like the talent development part that you do in Norway and um, up 2.0, where you really look for people, because I think this issue of like how to find people to represent like us in the film industry better is like a crucial one. I know that in Germany there is like a movement or there's the idea, if you cannot find people to represent like what we want to represent, um, by an inclusion right or so, then we'll offer uh, like paid internships or trainee programs to people from these industries, uh, from these parts of society that we can't represent. But unless you know where you go like even a bit further that, and I'm sure that happens in other countries as well, that you as like the Film Institute, you're really financing a program to develop specifically people from underrepresented um, parts of society. You're talking about uh, a program, yeah? 
Yeah, no, and, and what, we have this uh, program that we call Up to Zero, uh, where we have a group of um, uh, people that we try to include in, uh, uh, in filmmaking and, and be more like a door opener, uh, where a lot of uh, people find it really closed, you know. And uh, what we see that all the film we've seen here tonight is fantastic films, and but we also work with is that you don't necessarily need to tell a diversity story. You know, you can just tell whatever story you want. If you want to tell a story like a horror movie or even a blockbuster, or you know, it's fine because we see that a, a lot of um, this diversity is like this is people who is Norwegian and like everybody else and have their story, you know, somebody just want to make fun movies, others have strong stories that we've seen tonight, you know, that's fantastic uh, movies. And, and I think it's so important and documentaries and, and I think it's, um, that's also important to tell, you know, that you don't need to, you know, to, to tell your personal stories every time, you know, you can also uh, tell other stories, you know, uh, like we all do, you know, yeah. I think that's and this is important for our, our program up uh, uh, to zero, you know, uh, where we try to include them in, in whatever they need, you know, and uh, it's important for us in the talent program, it's that they really, you know, come to a point where they can make a film, and not only one film, but this is a living, you know, this is over life, this is over job, you know, when you are like 30, you know, you get, a, you know, you get married and get kids and, uh, you know, a house that you have to pay down, we have to, you know, make this work. So it's really important for us in this program is that you come to a point where you can actually make a film and another one and, you know, uh, and, and take them further, you know, this is a talent program that's called NEO. Uh, but uh, uh, where you can, you don't need so much fun, uh, private funding, so we can fund your film up to 80% with, uh, with our money, you know, um, and uh, so we can, it's, it's a good start, you know, and, uh, and it's important for us, not only the writers and the directors, but it's also important, it's the producer, so we can establish, you know, because we don't want no, uh, the Norwegian film institute to be your home. We want the, all the talents to create their own home, you know, and their own life, and 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 take them from this nail uh, to to uh, the other funding we have, you know. And we had that actually for two weeks ago. One of these uh, uh, members they get their first feature film in the in the main funding, you know, and. Uh, and they gave the, the, the you know, and uh, based on a fantastic book. And he make his debut, you know, but he has uh, also, we, he connected himself with a really good producer, you know, well-known producer. So that's something we also introduced them to. It's to, you, you don't necessarily need to make your own company, but, you know, that you can also come into these more well-established producers, you know, and taking care of you, you know, and... Uh, so, and, and it's, it's difficult because they all have different, um, they're on different levels. Uh, they have different stories, different things, you know, um, and, and, and uh, going from a short movie to a feature film and even a TV series is a really big step. And, uh, and I think it's uh, to be a door opener in these programs is, is really important. And back to what I tried to, uh, tell everybody in the beginning where I get this feedback and I, I didn't finish it, uh, but when I got this job for three months ago, the most important thing for us was to to just start hiring people in our own, own um, organizations. So now we have a diversity in who is a diversity, uh, who is a, a commissioner, is so important. I don't say if you are diversity and you come in, I don't say it's an automatic way of getting money, but now we have people inside who can educate us, you know, and also better understand uh, other culture when they are coming in because they are related to it, you know. And I think it's so important that we have to start with our own 
uh, organizations, you know. Because this is our society. I, that was I want to try to tell in the beginning. This is what's among us, you know. It's just uh, it's just around us, you know. And um, and we have a big job to do. And we can make reports, and uh, we can talk, and we can do whatever. But the only thing we have to do is just uh, we need to force ourselves uh, to just uh, do this. And and we have a lot of other funding. Also, the last couple of weeks, we try to found uh, funding um, all of these talents you know also in script funding and uh, in development and you know it's so important uh, just doing it you know because if not uh, we can't include them and it's so important also for the government we have a new government now and it's so important also that we we have to start in the school it's not norwegian film institute's um, job but we talk about this with the, the, the government because we have to start to even at children's school, you know, the middle school, high school. So people in the in in every society, a part of the society, see. It's, so I can be a filmmaker, you know, uh, and we need to give them some hope, uh, you know, and and also the parents who's trying to take decisions for their kids. You know, we see that. I was um, an associate uh, professor last year in one of the Norwegian's best film schools, Westerdals. And even there, we have to start, you know, uh, quote people in, you know, give people hope, uh, you know, and uh, because, because uh, if we can't do it through schools, when should they come in and, and, and be filmmakers, you know? So it's, it's complex, you know? But uh, but I think we we are on a good good way and and this uh, up program that we have is it's really working you know and we had also up one for um, uh, for the female also because we need uh, we also and this is an ongoing situation you know we we see that for the last year the the application for females went down and we are concerned about that you know. Uh, even we have uh, in in our rules that we we are going to support uh, a woman before a man if if is they're equal you know and uh, and uh, it's something we have to work so hard you know to to keep going you know it's it's not it's not a, a program we have this year it's it's every year you know so yeah Thank you so much do you, do you did you want to react to that I thought you wanted to say something or no you grabbed your microphone as if you wanted to say something sorry for that. Um, I, I mean, I think you raise a lot of important questions, and of course it is complex, but I think it is also uh, really good to see that like, we have to really start early in the industry to like, develop uh, like, more complexity and more diversion and more inclusivity like, in bringing people into the industry. Like someone like, said also in like, a different panel that I watched in preparation, that it's not, just, it's not like diversity like, applying with a job for us, it's really us trying to get like, a more diverse like, uh, like, like reality into the film industry to keep being relevant. I mean, this is also like if we don't make the films that are relevant to society as it is, then also like, like we can't like be surprised that like the audiences are not coming, that like people are not really interested if they don't feel represented. So like it's really like the effort is not just like, yeah, uh, like by us trying to be like good people and bringing like a better reality into like the representation uh, of society. Oh, everybody's raising their hand now. I don't know what I said. But, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, we need the people that are diverse, like to survive and to be relevant and to exist. I think this is really like the, it's the other way around a bit. So, yeah. can, I, can I just say one thing? Uh, sure, yeah. And then. No, I just want to also point that diversity for us, we also work with other kind of, you know, groups, you know, like handicapped, you know. Deaf people, you know, uh, you know, people from the regions, you know, there's, there's a lot of different kind of diversity uh, that we have to work with you and then try to, you know, to, to it, yeah, yeah. just move away. Yeah, thanks. Kada, you wanted to. Yeah, we just had our news numbers on di diversity in the as of what, what the need is for diversity in the audience and it's it's amazing to see like uh, that we 63 percent of the danish audience wants uh, diversity in the movies and you have like that they said yes and then you had like i think it was some percentage that said they don't didn't haven't you know thought about it 
but only 9% said they didn't want it. So this is, I'm just saying, we're not just saying this to be like, you know, oh, this is going to be a better society. The audience want this. We need to put this in the movies. It has to be out there. They have to mirror themselves in, in this, uh, like the society I live in is the same society I see on, on the screen. They want that. And, and it, they, they, they look through us if we don't give them it. Give, give, give it to them. Thanks, Kalle. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I completely agree with him. I mean, the audience always want to see themselves represented on the big screen. And it's the commissioner's responsibility to invest trust in the filmmakers and to make the filmmaking process and the funding so much easier. Because if they keep making difficult for the filmmakers to get funding, then these films and uh, the filmmakers will always take, take longer time to finance. For example, our film in, in, in the Finnish Film Foundation, if you're Finnish, but your story is set in another country with another language like myself, mm. my story, then you get less money than the film set in Finland, spoken in, in, in Finnish. So that's another way of also making the process longer for the filmmakers like us to find, to find more funding from other countries. So it takes more time to gather money from different countries. But if I said this story in Finland, then I could get 90% or 95% of the funding from Finland. So that also needs to mm. be changed, you know, to make it easier to get you know, more. Because if you are a part of the society, then you should have the same rights as everybody else in the society. Yeah. Helen, I think you wanted to react to that, and then Anders also, and Helge. And uh, I totally agree, Carter. Uh, well said. Uh, it's really a question of democracy, and that everyone has equal rights. And uh, I wonder if it's possible to just uh, end on a, another positive note. Uh, Larine, do, do you have the horror pictures? So yeah. uh, I think it's also what Anders. The when, two pictures you that you saying, sent. Uh, yeah. Let's uh, have yes. a, see if we can see them. Let's have some Swedish horror. Uh, uh, I want to end with uh, on the Swedish side with two positive notes uh, quickly. Uh, one is uh, the film Knocking uh, with the female uh, scriptwriter Emma Broström uh, and the uh, uh, debut from the acclaimed director Frida Kemp, uh, also female director. And also the stunning lead, uh, Cecilia Milocco, um, uh, who, who uh, is really doing a stunning performance. This film is actually opening, has its theatrical release in Sweden today, uh, tonight. Uh, and uh, I was very proud to support it through our debut scheme, Moving Sweden. And it's just the topic, it's the horror about being a middle-aged woman and not being trusted. I thought it might have some resonance uh, to this panel. And the tagline is, everyone needs to be heard. As you see to your left, uh, these are different uh, artwork from both the uh, English uh, version and the UK, uh, the, the UK release and the US release and the Swedish release. So I think that suits well with what Kadar also said, everyone needs to be heard. Mm -hmm. And the second picture, please, uh, that's actually from a film that's shooting right now in Gothenburg on the West Coast uh, with the mother and a child, if you could check. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry for, it's a bit blurry, it's uh, uh, right from shooting. Uh, this is from the team from Amina. They are now at today at shooting day 10. Mm -hmm. And I really would like to highlight it because it's a, a, like a Swedish Rocky meets the wrestler about Amida, Amina, a modern um, female lead. And here you can, on your left, you see the mother. She's actually a passionate MMR fighter with a big dilemma. Mm -hmm. Should she be a terrible single mom, or you see the little daughter on your right, or should she uh, choose her passion and drug the sport she loved, the MMR? And uh, 
the script that was quite explosive uh, when I read it and I loved it. It was uh, it's written by Mona Masri, uh, one of the writers uh, to Netflix Easy Money TV series. And this will be the exciting debut by uh, Ahmed uh, Abdullahi and the producer Veronica Önedal. Mm. So for the, all three of them, it will be their debut. And uh, hopefully it will be a gift to the audience yeah. um, next year. And I think this will be a perspective we haven't seen in Sweden before. And so I'm really excited about it. I just wanted to, yeah. this is happening in Sweden right now. Yeah. And Kadar, are you a friend of? Sorry for that. Uh, are you? Uh, are you? Are you? Were, were you? Did you know about this project, Amina? No. Uh, yes, Ahmed Abdullah is a good friend of mine, so oh, yeah. I know about this project. <laughs> Very good. Cool. Um, so we're running really, really late, and we haven't talked to the audience at all because we're also in a little circle of light here, and they're sitting in the dark there. But I did want to mention that, like at some moment, we have like maybe like five more, ten more minutes. If there's questions from the audience, if something is burning that you want to say, we have a microphone, and my colleague would love to come with you and uh, give us a little sign. Otherwise, also uh, Helge wanted to say something, and also Anders wanted to say something more. But Just feel free to join the conversation, like in the last meters of this talk, so. Basically just wanted to emphasize on something Kata said earlier, you know, if, if the regulations are that you get so much more money if you make a Finnish language film, then it, it clearly boils down to politics and to regulations. So especially as we are with the National Film Institute, that's a, that's a question of, of who's in charge of regulating culture politics. So that, that's basically just to, to bring it on, on to a high level. If you want to talk about nationality of, of films, that's a whole different ball game, but it's, it's um, at the end of the day, watch what you vote, because that's where exactly at that point it arrives. Yeah, thanks. Anders, did you want to, you wanted to add something at some moment? I don't know if it has passed on already to something else, or? Yeah, my uh, Danish colleague, he was just mentioned it, you know, and, and uh, I just want to follow up, it's that this is also business, you know? I mean, if you are a minority, it's a majority internationally. You know, and if, if you if your show or, or film want to travel, you know, I think it's also is part of the international financing. You know, I think it's so much easier also that, you know, because this is reflecting not only the Scandinavia or, you know, this reflects the whole world, you know, and I think it's so important to, to you know, keep up the work that we all do, you know, and uh, yeah, just want to say. And I think we have like two very good examples. I mean, Gala, your film has traveled a lot. Clara Sola has traveled a lot to be really representative of Sweden or Finland with these films around the world and festivals, as you're here in Lübeck, is going to send a signal and you're breaking grounds for like more projects, like hopefully in all countries in a way. So um, I think this is really like, uh, yeah, the reluctance and the insistence that you had and that you had to bring up uh, to really like not give up. Um, is something that uh, will hopefully really change things for many people coming after you. Um, yeah. If there's questions from the audience, now would be the moment. We're like running a bit over, but we still have a little moment if someone wants to ask something. And I have like 12 more cards with things written on it that I wanted to talk about. So you can, you can see I didn't get to say anything about New Dawn, about the academy, about research and data. So I think we could continue easily, I mean, me at least, for, like, for another 90 minutes. Um, but in the interest uh, of maybe not uh, keeping everybody for too long and also for the next event that we're going to have in here, um, if there's no questions from the audience, maybe you want to say like some final words? Uh, I think there's a lot of open questions. I think we discussed uh, some positive aspects and some change and some challenges that we're all still facing. Um, well, I can, I can have a... You can have a closing word. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know if it's a closing word, but maybe on a, on a positive <laughs> note at least. You know, I mean, I think every time we look at diversity, we're looking at a snapshot. We're looking at, at the situation as we see it now, and that's basically a look in the, into the past. I mean, all the films that we are, the whole situation we are looking at at the moment has been created three to five years ago, whatever, how long it takes to make films. So all these films have been conceived with a different understanding of diversity as we see it now, maybe. So I think we will see 
the understanding of diversity as we have it right now in 2021 will be reflected in 23, 24. And I think we will see a different world. I think we will see shifts. I know for a fact that there's no funding institution in Europe, I dare to say, that doesn't speak about diversity, that doesn't open up the channels, some more, some less, and uh, same for broadcasters. So I, I don't think it's, it's not dire, it's a process, it's a journey, um, it's a learning curve. And, but it's ongoing. I don't know, I didn't yeah. want to steal a closing word, but maybe that's a good news at least. So. I think it's a very good closing word. It's a snapshot, it's ongoing. And uh, yeah, I, I hope very much that, uh, not next year, because I don't think we're gonna talk about diversity again next year, but then on the next panel that we do on diversity, firstly, all of you are gonna be here in person <laughs> and we don't have to talk to you on screens, but thanks anyway for being a part of this. I hope that the audience is not going to sit in the shadow, but join the conversation a bit more as we usually do. And this was a bit. Uh, yes. And that was the last point. Exactly. Thanks for saying that. That it's not going to be just like white dudes and like one woman and one person of color. Like there were a few more women, but still, that we're going to have a, like a more diverse representation also structurally uh, on this panel. So, um, with this, I'm saying thank you to the audience. You were very patient, and I hope you kind of took something from this as well. If you were at home at screens, I should look in this camera, but I'm looking at the audience now, the real audience. Um, a real pleasure, and we will hopefully have time here in Lübeck at the festival to talk about diversity and about the films and about all of this more. And uh, for everybody at home at the screens, thank you for braving the uh, mice on steroid sounds and other technical issues that we faced. And <laughs> I was very happy to, in the end, hear your voices and hear what you have to say. Uh, and thanks, Enjoy. Helge, for being here in person. Yeah, thanks for, the, for braving the echo. <laughs> it's not pleasant. And um, thank you for Kada. Thank you for Geraldine. Thanks for Eva to bringing like, their experience as filmmakers to the panel. Thanks, Helge, for being here. And thank you for being here as well. And with this, I say thanks. Goodbye. Thank you.